Ready? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alameen. Salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Thank you all for coming out to this lecture on uh, comparative uh, religion today. And uh, for those of you who are watching us on the on the web, thank you for tuning in. Uh, on, in today's lecture, I want to look at uh, the mention of our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the previous scriptures, uh, in the Torah and uh, the Injil, in the Bible in general. Uh, so when, when the Quran speaks about our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in relation to the previous prophets, the Quran has the idea uh, that the previous prophets uh, made a covenant with God that they will uh, support uh, our Prophet. They will support the Prophet when that Prophet comes to them. Uh, we find that, that there is mention uh, of a Prophet in the book of Deuteronomy as it exists today. Uh, and uh, in the New Testament, we find uh, that Isa alayhi salam speaks about some figure to come after him. Uh, some Christian scholars have said that uh, this is a reference to a prophet, though generally Christians take this as a reference to the Holy Spirit. Uh, but we will uh, try to unravel all of these traditions and uh, see what lies at the base of uh, this, uh, uh, these two competing uh, interpretations of uh, uh, what these scriptures are speaking about. Uh, so, let us begin uh, with the story of Abraham, as told in the book of Genesis in, in the Bible. The book of Genesis is a part of uh, what our Jewish friends refer to as the Torah. They say that the Torah comprises five books, Genesis being the first of them. And uh, uh, our Christian friends have uh, adopted the Jewish uh, Bible, basically, and they've called it the Old Testament, and they've added to that the New Testament. So if we're speaking about something in the Old Testament, we're speaking about something that is common uh, to the Jews and the Christians. It is part of their scripture. And the Torah is found in the Old Testament, uh, the book of Genesis, the first book, therefore, of both the Jewish scriptures and also the Christian scriptures. Now, in the book of Genesis, we have the story of Abraham, and uh, Abraham uh, journeys to Egypt where he gets uh, a handmaid, uh, Hagar, and uh, from Hagar, Ishmael is born. Ishmael is the son of Abraham, and he's specifically called Abraham's son in the Bible, so there's no doubt about that. Uh, Abraham has another son, Isaac, and Isaac would become the uh, ancestor of the Jewish people. Uh, Ishmael would become the ancestor of Arabs. And uh, the genealogy of our Prophet Muhammad and whom be peace is traced to Abraham through Ishmael. Now, because of the Bible, uh, this at least this part that we're talking about, is written by the descendants of Isaac, uh, we find that uh, in more than one instances there is uh, a, uh, a, a bias in favor of those uh, descendants of, of Isaac. Uh, so, and, and not only uh, on one occasion, but we find that one after another, uh, a mother has two sons, and then there is a struggle as, uh, to, to recognize one of them as the uh, ascendant son. Now, normally, in these times, there was a, the, the recognition that the firstborn son had a supremacy over his uh, siblings. Uh, so, what happens if uh, the the descendants of, of the Jew, of, of like the people of Israel, are actually descendants of one who is not the firstborn son in that family. Sometimes we see that uh, there is a, a need to recognize that their ancestor is actually superior to his uh, firstborn brother. So we find this, for example, in the case of Jacob and Esau. And Jacob uh, and, uh, and uh, Esau our, our, our uh, brothers, and Esau is the firstborn son. And uh, Yaqub, Jacob, who will become now the ancestor of the Jewish people, uh, is shown to be superior to his brother Esau, but through a convoluted story. The story is that uh, Isaac, in his old age, that is his hawk, uh, in his old age, uh, called his, said to his son, uh, uh, come and I will give you a blessing. Uh, but first of all, you have to go and get me that um, uh, the, the stew that I like to eat. So, uh, first that means that the son has to go into the forest, he has to kill the animal, bring the animal, cook it, 
give his father the stew, the father will be happy, and then he will announce a blessing on the son. So the son in question here is Esau. He's the firstborn son. He will get the blessing of his father. Uh, he goes out, and, and he's get, going to get the animal. But in the meantime, Jacob's mother knows about what is going to transpire, and uh, he knows that the father, she knows that the father is ready to give this blessing. So she tells Jacob, you know what? You have to go ahead and get this blessing. So she wrapped goat skins on, on the hand of Jacob because Esau, the older brother, was, was, was hairy. He had a lot of hair. And by this time, Isaac had lost his vision. So Isaac has the two sons, Esau and Jacob, just so long to be sure that you're following, right? So now Esau is the firstborn. He needs to get the blessing of his father, but he has to go bring the animal and cook the stew. So he's gone into the forest. Jacob, the younger brother, is now instigated by his mother, and with goatskins wrapped on his wrists, he goes now to the father. So the father touches his wrists and uh, says, okay, this is my son, this is Esau. Right? Says in his own mind. And now he confers the blessing on the, the, on, on the younger son, on Jacob. Meanwhile, Esau comes back. And Esau realizes what has uh, happened. And uh, uh, Esau now is deprived of that, uh, that blessing as the firstborn son. So now Jacob takes over that blessing and he gets the supremacy as if he was the firstborn son. Now a story like this obviously is not uh, uh, believable. Like it's not believable that this man, because he's lost his vision, he's going to touch goat skins and he's going to think this is the skin of my son. So something is wrong in the story. Uh, but the best explanation for this story is that the, the, the people of Israel writing the story they want to prove that their ancestor is the superior one in the family and that he has the birthright from his father even though he's not the firstborn son. So this is the problem. We can find the same problem with the sons of Tamar, uh, but that will delay us and we don't have the uh, time now to go into detail. Uh, but now more to our point, Abraham. Abraham, and we're dealing with two sons. One is clearly the firstborn son, that is Ishmael. The other is Isaac, and the Israelites trace their ascendancy, or they trace themselves as descendants back to Isaac. And uh, the writers of the book of Genesis want to show uh, that Isaac is superior. So what uh, happens here is that they have a story in which the, uh, the mother of Ishmael and Ishmael himself are driven out, and uh, by the deliberate act, act of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So the story is. Ishmael, uh, Ismail alayhi salam, was about 14 years old when his brother was, was born. Or 13, I don't remember exactly. It seems like 14, 14. He was 14 years old, his brother was born. And when his brother was to be weaned, which is probably about two years old, uh, at that time it was found, Sarah, the mother of, uh, of uh, Ishaq, the, the, the younger of the two, um, finds that Ismail uh, is making like fun of the, of the younger brother. So she, now apparently filled with jealousy, says to Abraham, that child cannot inherit along with my son. You must take that bond woman, because in the Bible, Hagar uh, is shown to be a bond woman, uh, Amma. Uh, so take that woman, that bond woman and her son and drive them out. That's her instruction to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And Ibrahim obeys this jealous rant of his wife and takes the, the mother and child and leaves them in the desert. So that's the biblical story. As if she has to be driven out, the son cannot inherit along with, with, her, with, uh, with his sibling. Though he's the firstborn, he now obviously loses the title. See, and loses that position in the family. And now that position gets to be given to Ishaq, who is the, ascend, uh, the, the ancestor uh, of the Jewish people. So you see there's a bias in the story. They do not represent Ismail alayhi salam, uh, as he should be represented. In fact, they say that uh, there is a prophecy about him that he will be a wild donkey of a man. And his hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him. 
uh, as if he will be like he will be a warrior, and that's uh, about it. But despite their attempts to rewrite the story and to make uh, Ishaq look superior to Ismail salam, we find that there are still clear indications that there, a blessing has been afforded to. Uh, is, uh, to Ismail alayhi salam. And uh, one manifestation of this is that when God said to Abraham, I will make you a great nation, God also said to, uh, about Ishmael that God will make him a great nation. Now, when, when a promise like this comes from God, obviously the promise is not uh, that people will have uh, lots of wealth or, or vast kingdoms, but that they will be a great nation of people worshipping and serving God. If I go to a Christian family uh, and I say, you know, I saw in a dream uh, that your family will be a great family in the eyes of God. What would it mean to that good Christian family? It means that we will be devout people worshiping God. But whatever other blessings we have, it cannot be that the blessing of uh, being with God is, is taken away. They have to be on the right path here. Because just as a Muslim will be quite saddened if their children turn away from the path of Islam, in a similar way, a Christian family will be saddened if they're serious about their faith. They will be saddened if one of their children turns away from their faith. This is natural. As it's natural for people of any other religion. They, they sincerely are following a religion, believing this to be the religion of God and the right path. So their children had better be on that path. That will be their dream come true. Uh, but if their children go astray, uh, that, that will cause them heartache. So if the promise is coming to them that you will be a great nation or you'll be a great family, uh, naturally it's uh, taken for granted that they will be on the right religion. So when Ishmael uh, or Ismail alayhi salam, is being promised that he will be a great nation, naturally it must be that his followers, his, his, his descendants, will be on the right guidance, in addition to whatever other uh, blessings uh, will come to them. So when the Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, now comes on the scene and he's a descendant of Ismail alayhi salam, and he rises as a world prophet and the religion that he preaches becomes a, a major, major religion in the world, uh, this obviously this is the manifestation of that promise that was made to him. And one cannot say that this was just a material uh, promise that, okay, they will be great in terms of numbers uh, or great in terms of, of wealth. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, we find that uh, it is actually generally acknowledged that the, the prophecy and the promise to Ismail alayhi salam needed to be fulfilled and that that prophecy was actually fulfilled uh, at, a time, at the time of the coming of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the ascendancy of Islam as a, uh, an empire. Uh, as it eventually manifested. Uh, so much so that this here is a book written by a person who debated uh, uh, Sheikh Ahmad Didat, he debated uh, Dr. Jamal Badawi, and he debated me as well. We had a series of debates in, uh, in the Glasgow, in the United Kingdom, and uh, videos of, of those debates must be available on, on the web somewhere. I think we still have some copies of those uh, in our bookshop. So his name is Dr. Anish Sharosh. Uh, he is a Palestinian and a Christian, and, and he uh, saw it as, a, as a, po a point in his favor that he knows some Arabic, and and he wanted to debate Muslims. He wrote this book entitled Islam Revealed, a, Christians, a Christian Arab's view of, of Islam. Uh, on, in this book, he says on page 208, I will make him a great nation. He puts that in quotation mark because that's from the Bible, re referring to Ismail as we said before. I will make him a great nation was fulfilled when the Muslim empire was a reality from the 7th to the 12th centuries. So he's saying that when God said to uh, uh, Abraham that he will make Ishmael into a great nation, of course it took many uh, hundreds of years, but eventually it happened. From the 7th to the 12th centuries, uh, Islam rose as a great empire, and uh, this is how that promise to Ismail alayhi salam was fulfilled. Of course, he would not take the next step of saying that Islam is the truth, uh, 
but you see the connection that I've made before. When the promise is made, it cannot be just that you will have lots of children. In fact, if I say to any Muslim brother here that, uh, you know, let's make dua to Allah that you will have many children who will be rich but not on the right guidance, I don't think you will accept that, that dua. Okay, you want them not only to be rich, but to be under right guidance. In fact, if they're under right guidance, you don't really care if they're rich. You just want them to have a decent, comfortable uh, life, but on the uh, right guidance. A similar sort of uh, acknowledgement is made in this commentary on the Torah. This is a commentary only on the, on the uh, five books of the, of the Torah and uh, some um, uh, other books uh, uh, besides. Uh, but it's not of the whole, of the whole Bible. It's uh, mainly on the, on the Torah itself. And uh, this is called the stone edition of the Chumash. The Chumash is a, is a commentary on, on, the, on the Bible. It's a traditional uh, Jewish commentary. And commenting on the, the, the verse in question, which is in the 17th chapter of uh, Genesis, uh, the 20th verse, the verse reads, and I'll read it for you, uh, but regarding Ishmael, I have heard you, I have blessed him, will make him fruitful and will increase him most exceedingly. He will beget 12 princes and I will make him into a great nation. I will make him into a great nation. So the part of interest for us is uh, making him into a great nation. So this is what this commentary says. This is on page, uh, what page number is this? of the commentary. Page 76. So on page 76 it says, we see from the prophecy in this verse that 2,337 years elapsed before the Arabs, Ishmael's descendants, became a great nation. And then in, in brackets, with the rise of Islam in the 7th century. Dot, 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 dot. Throughout this period, Ishmael hoped anxiously until finally the promise was fulfilled and they dominated the world. We, the descendants of Isaac, for whom the fulfillment of the promises made to us is delayed due to our sins, dot, 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 should surely anticipate the fulfillment of God's promises and not despair. The reason for the dot, dot, dot is because this commentary is quoting some other uh, scholars before, Jewish scholars. So they, they refer to the scholars by name, uh, Rabbi uh, Bach, Bachia, uh, uh, who also was citing another rabbi, uh, Hananel. Okay, so the, the, uh, the Jewish tradition goes like this, rabbi quoting rabbi o over time, sometimes expanding, sometimes contracting uh, what they're quoting, and so on. So that's the reason for the dot, dot, dot. They're not quoting the whole thing. But what, is, what remains now in the quotation is clearly that these rabbis are saying that 2,337 years uh, elapsed from the time of Ishmael, Ismail alayhi salam, from the time the promise was made to the time that Islam rose as an empire. And that long time, 2,000 and more years elapsed, and the, uh, that means there was a promise, it was not fulfilled. It's as if God made a promise and people are looking around and Ishmael's descendants are saying, like, where, where is the fulfillment of that promise? God promised us, didn't happen yet. So it took 2,000 years. So, so this, the, these rabbis are saying to the Jewish people, we, the descendants of Isaac, uh, uh, we have been promised something as well, but the fulfillment of that promise has been delayed due to our sins. But he's saying we shouldn't lose hope, because just as the promise to Ishmael was fulfilled more than 2,000 years later with the rise of Islam, uh, the promise to us will eventually be fulfilled as well. That, that's, that's the point that they're making. They're not making the point that Muhammad Sallallahu is a true prophet or that he is the prophet mentioned in, in the Bible or anything like that. But you can put the pieces together. The, the, the rise of Islam is the fulfillment of that prom prophecy which was made to uh, Ismail salam, according to this Jewish commentary on the Bible. So, once we realize that uh, the promise can only be fulfilled when we're talking about righteous descendants uh, of Ismail alayhi salam, we realize that Islam is the religion of God uh, and that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, is the prophet of God and it is through his coming that that prophecy to Ismail alayhi salam, has been uh, fulfilled. 
Now, uh, still within the books of Genesis, we have uh, the books of the Torah, we have the book Deuteronomy, which is the last of the five books that comprise the Torah. So the book of Deuteronomy is part of the Old Testament, and that means that it is part of both the Christian and the Jewish uh, Bibles. In the book of Deuteronomy, uh, God uh, speaks to Moses in chapter 18. And it says to him, to tell the Israelites that uh, God is going to raise a, a prophet. Now, the, ostensibly, the way in which the uh, prophecy is mentioned, it is as if this uh, prophecy, the, the, the prophet that is going to come, uh, will be from among them. But one uh, passage says, from among their brethren, from among their brethren. And uh, if we interpret brethren broadly, then that can include the, the cousins. Uh, because, you, you know, the Arab tradition is like this. People regard as brother, uh, ach, uh, brother, even though they're not uh, related by family. Uh, at least in, in the Bible, uh, it is mentioned that, uh, remember how we said there is this difference between uh, Esau and, uh, and Jacob, remember the two sons, the one who went to get the stew for his father and the other one who stole the blessing in the meantime. Uh, so they, they, in the Bible, the descendants of one, the Edomites, are called the brothers of the Israelites. Even though they're from two different brothers, that means they're distant cousins, but still they're called brothers. One nation, a brother to the other nation. So it is not far-fetched to think that the descendants of Ishmael are the brethren of the descendants of Ishaq. So when uh, Musa a.s. is announcing to the people that this prophet will come from among your brothers, it could be from the broader, from the broader family base, meaning that it could also come from the Ishmaelites. It's a possibility. So some people read this and they say, oh, it must only come from the Israelites. And that's wrong, because brother can be interpreted more broadly in the Bible, as we can show in the case of the Edomites, who were called the brothers of the Israelites, even though they descended from another uh, brother uh, than, than the one from whom the Israelites descended. So once we recognize that then, now we must look around to see who is that prophet to come after Musa, a.s. Now, after Musa a.s., there was a successor, Joshua, who is actually called a prophet. But uh, no one says that he is that prophet, as if there was only one prophet. In fact, uh, commentators on the Bible today, for example, in the New Jerome Biblical Commentary, uh, say that uh, when, it's, when it mentions prophet in the singular, actually it means not just one prophet, though it is in the singular, but it is actually referring to a succession of prophets to come over time. Such that whenever there is a need for a prophet, a prophet will arise. And that accounts for and explains the fact that in the Bible, there are many prophets, not just simply one prophet, but many prophets. So, when this is the understanding then that there will be many prophets arising over time, the question then is, uh, what puts an end to the series of prophets? We must know. Like, uh, suppose God says, okay, I'm going uh, to send prophets. So now you're always on the lookout, where are the prophets, right? Uh, see another person, maybe this person is a prophet because God said he's going to send prophets. Maybe there's another prophet here in our time. So how do you know that a last one has come? And there has to be a definite marker. In the case of Muslims, when Muslims say that our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is Khatim and Nabiyyin, uh, and understand that to mean that he is the seal of the Prophet such that no other Prophet will come after him. When there are clear uh, hadith attributed to the Prophet وسلم, in which he says, La Nabiya Ba'di, now that becomes very clear. There is no Prophet after me. So now for, for Muslims, if somebody else comes and says that he's a Prophet, we say no, he's automatically a false Prophet because our Prophet وسلم, is declared to be the last prophet. But suppose he didn't declare himself to be the last prophet. If another person comes to and says that he's a prophet, we have to think, okay, just like our prophet Muhammad ﷺ was a prophet, maybe there's another prophet here as well, right? We, we have to find some way of discounting and proving that he's not a prophet. Otherwise, we have to accept him as possibly a prophet of, of God. But with the prophet, peace be upon him, declaring, La Nabi Abadi, uh, and, and other such statements, no prophet after me, and now we are clear he is the last prophet, everyone else who claims that he is a prophet after him must automatically be a false claimant. Now, uh, there is no such claim in the Bible. 
uh, the Jewish Bible to begin with. There are prophets one after another, but none of them says, I am the last prophet. And we know that after the Jewish Bible, uh, we have the coming of Isa alayhi salam, and he's the true prophet, according to Muslims and according to Christians. So that means when Jews settle with their uh, scriptures, as if they have the entire revelation here, Christians are saying, no, you don't have the entire thing. There is another prophet who came after those prophets that you already recognize, that is Isa alayhi salam. But we are also saying something similar to our Christian friends. Okay, so you accepted Isa alayhi salam as a prophet and, and messenger of God and Messiah and whatever else you say about him, but how do you know that he was the last prophet? If he said, I am the last prophet, well then, you know that that's the end of the story, right? But if, he, if it's not recorded that he said that, then how do you know there's not another prophet to come after Isa alayhi salam? Well, one response from our Christian friends uh, will be to say that uh, there have been prophets coming over time, but now Isa alayhi salam is God himself having come. So now, when God has come himself, what need is there for another prophet? And in fact, there is a passage in the Christian New Testament that says something to this very effect. Prophets used to come, but now the Son of God has, has come. And now, there does not seem to be a need for any other prophet. So, that took, for them, the matter is closed right there. Moreover, uh, there, there are statements in the New Testament in the Christian part of the Bible, in which Isa alayhi salam speaks about someone to come after him. And one passage in, in, within the wider context here uh, specifically says that the one Isa alayhi salam is speaking about is the Holy Spirit. And, and Christians understand that not as the angel Jibreel alayhi salam, uh, as the angel Gabriel, but they understand that reference to the Holy Spirit to be a reference to the third person in the Holy Trinity. They say that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The three together uh, are one God. That Holy Spirit, they say, uh, that, that is a part of the Godhead. And, and that is what Isa alayhi salam was speaking about. And how does that Holy Spirit come? That Holy Spirit comes and dwells in the hearts uh, uh, of the Christian believers. And Christians experience, we have the Holy Spirit. Somebody will come to you and say, I have the Holy Spirit. Uh, and that Holy Spirit is guiding them and teaching them what to do in, in, a, in an indirect way, like inspiring their minds. So they are following the guidance based on this Holy Spirit. So they say that when Isa alayhi salam was speaking about the one to come after him, that was the Holy Spirit and we got him already and there does not seem to be any need for a prophet. Moreover, when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, comes and he preaches a message which is different from the Christian message, they say that is proof enough that he is a false prophet. All right? First of all, we did not expect another prophet. We're not hoping for one. We got everything we need. Second, the prophet you're talking about teaches the contrary of what we believe. So it must be that what we believe is right, what your prophet says is, is wrong. And he's not a true prophet. Okay? So that's how the matter is left with them. But now let's go deeper. Uh, it, uh, there is a, the prophecy, as we mentioned, where Isa alayhi salam speaks about one to come after him. Uh, so is that about the Holy Spirit? And is it uh, uh, true that Isa alayhi salam is the son of God or God so that the matter is closed? Uh, first of all, let's deal with this uh, matter of Isa alayhi salam uh, uh, being God. Uh, to say that he is God leads to irreconcilable complications. And uh, the best way out of that is to say that he's not God. Uh, because for him to be God, that means either he is uh, completely God and only being disguised as a man, uh, or he is a, a man that was mistakenly pronounced as God. People took him to be God, but he's not so. Or he is both man and God. So our uh, Christian friends will say that he was both man and God. He's not just simply God in, in a disguise. Uh, he, is, uh, he appears to be a man, and he's also a man. But now, that means that two uh, contrary things have to be uh, reconciled here. Because to be God, he has to be perfect in his knowledge. He has to know everything. There cannot be one fact that he does not know. If there's one fact that he does not know, that means he's not the omniscient, all-knowing God. And for him to be human, be, human, it means that he's not omniscient. A human, by definition, is not omniscient. We don't know everything. No human knows everything. And perhaps even the 
not even perhaps, but definitely so. Even the collective of all humans together, we don't know everything. Adding all of the human knowledge together, we don't know everything, right? So, by definition, Jesus as a man is not omniscient. He does not know everything. So, you must have in the one person, uh, the two minds. One that knows everything, and knows that he knows everything. And the other that does not know everything and knows that he does not know everything. He knows himself to be a man. To know himself to be a man, he has to know that I don't know everything. So you have to have two minds. And if you have two minds here, you do not have one person as Jesus. You have two persons. You have Jesus the God and Jesus the man, both sharing the one body. But in fact, classical definitions of Christian theology do not accept that Jesus would have been of two minds. They want the two to be so integrated so that you don't have a God and a man, you have a God-man. And this is impossible, it just does not happen. If we are to put it another way, for Jesus to be a man, he has to know that he's not God. Because a man who thinks that he is God, we would classify him as mad. So if, if and uh, this argument actually only came about in the Middle Ages when people started to study psychology. Uh, so they, they realized that Isa alayhi salam as a human being could not think that he is God. The human side of him could, has to know that he's a man and he's not God. So if he thinks that he's not God, well then, he's not God. Because it cannot be the case that he is God and he thinks that he's not God. So you see, that this is an irreconcilable contradiction to say that Isa alayhi salam is God. Okay, so what about the, question, the idea that he's the son of God? In, in that distinctive sense that God sent his son. Uh, this too does not make sense in, in light of what we know from history because we can see that over time Isa alayhi salam was being promoted like this. Uh, as historians now are peeling back through the uh, layers of interpretation, uh, century after century, how people have come to conceive of Jesus, they're arriving at Jesus, a historical figure who was a human being, a Jewish rabbi, an ordinary person uh, in terms of flesh and blood, is not somebody who claimed to be son of God in that special way. And maybe if somebody took him as son of God in the sense like the, there are sons of God in the Bible, like David is called son of God, Solomon is called son of God, Israel, the nation as a whole, is called son of God. If somebody said that, they're speaking about the metaphorical use of son. It's like if I go out on the street, I meet a, a, a kid, put my hand on his head and say, my son, uh, you know, take care of yourself as you're crossing the street. So that shows my compassion for this uh, little boy. Uh, it, it, it doesn't mean that literally he is my son. It, it means that I have compassion for him. So, uh, in the same way, uh, people are called sons of God in the Bible. It doesn't mean that they're literally sons of God. It just means that they're beloved to God. So, if somebody said that Isa is son of God in that sense, the, the dispute between Islam and Christianity would not be great. But they said, no, he's literally the son of God. But that, of course, historically is hard to establish because it is clear that Isa a.s. did not go around teaching this by, uh, about himself. And for somebody to claim this, that he is son of God in that sense, that he has to be the second person of the Holy Trinity, or that he is like a pre-existing being uh, through whom the entire world was created, as Jehovah's Witnesses would say, uh, then it, he has to come and make that claim himself. Like, otherwise, how do we know that one of you here is not the son of God? How, how do I know, brother, that you are not the son of God? How do we know that God only has one son? Maybe he has many, and so on. This opens up a whole, uh, uh, can I say, a can of worms. Uh, because once you open it, you cannot close it. If you say that God has a son, what about a daughter? And, and so on. So the, the best way to retract from all of these uh, problems is to say that Isa a.s. did not claim this himself. He was a man, a prophet, a messenger of God. And uh, the, the prophecy did not close with him. Isa a.s. is recorded in the pages of the New Testament, in the Christian Bible, uh, to be speaking about uh, prophets to possibly come after him. Uh, because he gives his followers a way to distinguish between true and false prophets. He said, by your, their fruits you will know them. So that means that if a prophet comes to, uh, somebody comes and he claims to be a prophet, you should judge him by his fruits. 
Like what are his teachings? What are the deeds coming from him? Are these teachings and deeds befitting of a man who is a prophet of God? Or are these uh, more indications of a person who is concocting his own uh, teachings as he's going and he is like preaching falsehood and calling people towards filthy things? Uh, so that's what has to be judged. So you judge them by their fruits to see what they're doing to know whether they are a true prophet or not. Or not. Now, suppose Isa alayhi salam was to be the last prophet. Suppose he knew I am the last prophet. What might he have said to his followers? He might say something like, look, I am the last prophet. If anyone comes after me and says that he's a prophet, you know automatically he's a false prophet. Why would he be telling them that if anyone comes to be and claims to be a prophet, judge him by his fruits to decide for yourself whether he's true or false? That means there is a possibility that a true prophet may come after him. And, and this is the point now that we're making. And that Isa alayhi salam was not the last of the prophets. There is no indication in the Bible, as there is an indication in the Quran, that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the seal of the prophets. There is no indi such indication in the Bible that Isa alayhi salam is the seal of the prophet. So that means there's a possibility of a prophet to come after him. Now, to wrap up our discussion then, what about the mention that the one will come after him who in one passage is referred to as the Holy Spirit. Specifically in John chapter 14 verse 26 it says the Paracletus, the Holy Spirit. So our Christians friends will say, oh that Paracletus that was being spoken about, that is the Holy Spirit, he already came, the matter is done. But now we have to go deeper. When Jesus was speaking about this figure, uh, I already mentioned the term paracletus. That is the term that is used to denote that person. The paracletus. The paracletus this is a Greek term. Uh, and sometimes it is rendered in English as paraclete. Paraclete. Still intending the Greek term. Sometimes it is translated as comforter. The comforter will come after me. Uh, sometimes it's translated as the advocate. The advocate will come. Why do they have two different translations? Naturally, when we are translating, sometimes two different words are possible. But the Greek word parakletos has proven to be especially difficult for the translators. You will find in a Quranic word is translated two different ways, sometimes three different ways, if you go from one translation of the Quran to another, right? Seldom do you have a, a, an entire article written just to explain the meaning of one word. So too with the New Testament. Usually, where if you're reading the New Testament, you read a commentary on the New Testament, there will be some discussion of the meanings of words as you go. Um, paragraph, you know, here's what the word means, different uses of the word, what it can mean in various contexts and so on. And, and when it comes to paracletus, often in the commentaries, there is an appendix. An appendix just to explain what this term paracletus means. Why the appendix? Spanning many pages. We find this in uh, uh, Raymond Brown's commentary on, on, on the Gospel according to John. We find this in Rudolf Boltmann's commentary on the Gospel according to, to John. So why this extensive commentary on just the meaning of the term paracletus? Uh, because it has proven problematic. They want to find a meaning that will apply in all of the verses in which Jesus speaks about the Paracletus. Uh, Jesus speaks about him in John chapter 14, John chapter 15, John chapter 16. And then there is another mention of Paracletus in one of the letters of, of John that says that we have a Paracletus in heaven and there it is translated as intercessor. We have an intercessor in heaven. So they cannot find a single meaning that will apply in all of the places. And the term paracletus to apply to the, one, to the Holy Spirit now, this becomes also especially uh, problematic. Because one of the meanings of paracletus is uh, as a kind of advocate. One who will stand as your defender, especially in a court of law. So you go to a court of law, you have your defender who stands there with you and speaks on your behalf. He defends you. That is an advocate. That is a paracletus on one meaning of the term. So how does this apply to the Holy Spirit? 
It doesn't seem to apply because the Holy Spirit is more an inner sort of inspiration to Christians. So if the Christian appears in the court of law, the Holy Spirit can be only be said to inspire the Christian with the right answer, but the Christian will have to speak for himself or herself and defend themselves in the court of law. They don't have a defender by their side. Moreover, parakletos in the Greek come from the Greek term parakleo, uh, which means one uh, to call, to call to one's side. So parakletos uh, almost is like one call to your side, just like the advocate. Now if you think of the function of the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace in terms of the believers, you think of the believers being there behind the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He goes ahead and he speaks on, uh, uh, on behalf of the believers as a leader and as a defender of the believer. So it seems to fit. The idea that the Paracletus then is a human being and a prophet to come after Jesus, this became uh, acknowledged by some important Christian scholars over time. Most recently, most recently, a scholar in the United States by the name of Ian uh, Mevorak, Ian Mevorak, M-E-V-O-R-A-C-H, has written two articles which were posted on the Huffington Post, an online um, uh, news service, the Huffington Post. And his articles are still there. You can search for the name of this person, Ian Mevorak, and you will find his articles on the spirit of truth. Now, some passages dealing with this paraclete in John chapters 14, 15, and 16 refer to him as the spirit of truth. And uh, Ian Mavarak says that the one Jesus was referring to uh, as the spirit of truth could very well be the prophet Muhammad. Though he's a Christian himself, he's analyzing this purely from an in uh, the point of view of a Christian interpreting the Bible and uh, needing to say something about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, he says that it is best to say that this person uh, uh, is the one that was being spoken about, uh, that it's the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now he makes the point, if Muhammad was not a prophet, then who would qualify as a prophet? Like you have to know what, 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 what's meant by a prophet. Uh, simply, a prophet is one who speaks on behalf of God. Now, a person comes and he says he's speaking on behalf of God. We're going to analyze his teachings, we're going to see uh, his actions, and then we're going to decide for, him, for ourselves, is this really a man of God or not, right? Okay, so there's some talk in the back. I hope that those sisters who are trying to listen can, can hear me. Can you guys hear me? Because I know that the ch children are talking. If it disturbs you, let me know. I'll ask the children to be quiet. Is this fine? Okay. Uh, so, the, uh, the, the prophet has to be examined uh, based on his claims. When we see the life of the prophet, peace be upon him, and we think about what a prophet normally does, uh, we, we compare that with those who are known to be prophets from the Old Testament of the, of the Jewish Bible. And, and we see that the prophet, peace be upon him, does very much the kinds of things and he acts in the kinds of ways in which the prophets were acting before him. So he looks like a prophet like them. And if you say that Muhammad وسلم, is not a prophet, then you have to go back and say that those other persons were not prophets either. So this is Mevarak's point. If Muhammad is not a prophet, then who is? This is the point. You have to either accept them all or you discount them all. The Muslim attitude is that we accept them all. All of those were prophets, prophets of the Old Testament. Isa a.s. was a prophet and now the Prophet Muhammad a.s. himself came as a prophet. So now that we've come this far, uh, we have seen that there is a definite pronouncement in the Bible that the paraclete, the one to come after Isa a.s. is the Holy Spirit. So what do we do with that? Our Christian friends will often show us that and say, that settles the question. Now we have to say, it doesn't settle the question because we're not asking what John wrote. We're asking what Isa a.s. said. When Isa a.s. spoke, was he speaking about another prophet to come after him? Or was he speaking about the Holy Spirit? John wrote that this is the Holy Spirit. John wrote that Isa a.s. said that this is the Holy Spirit. But is it possible that when Isa a.s. spoke, it wasn't about the Holy Spirit, but about another human being and a prophet to come after him? So that is our important question. And that means we have to peel back from the pages of the Gospel according to John to find out what Isa a.s. said before these words were written. So did he say the Holy Spirit? Uh, to begin with, 
How could he say something like, it is imperative that I go away, for if I do not go away, the spirit cannot come. What does it mean the Spirit cannot come? If, according to Christian belief, what they're talking about here is the Holy Spirit, this is the ever-present, from all eternity, third person of the Holy Trinity. So, there's no sense that Isa has to go for the other one to come. And in fact, in the New Testament, there is already mentioned that the Holy Spirit was there in various uh, occasions. There is the presence of the Holy Spirit. For example, very early in the career of Isa salam, it is said that the Holy Spirit came down upon Isa salam in the form of a dove. So the Holy Spirit was always around, according to the, the, the scriptures themselves. In the Old Testament, uh, the, uh, what is called a spirit, or the Spirit of God, is uh, something like a force that comes from God and, and makes people powerful. Like you know the story of Samson, right? Samson tears a lion apart with his own bare hands. A powerful guy. But what gives him that power? Uh, often it is said in the Bible that the Spirit of God comes upon him and that gives him the, the power. Okay? So that means the Spirit of God was all the, uh, uh, always available and around since the time of Samson. It's not like Isa salam has to go away in order for the Holy Spirit to come. But if Isa salam was speaking about a prophet to come after him, then it is simple that there is a succession of prophets one after another. One goes and then the other one comes. So that makes sense. So there are many indications like this. Once we are willing to go back and peel past uh, to see what Isa salam actually said, that uh, it starts to, indi to uh, appear as if Isa salam was actually speaking about a prophet to come after him. Unfortunately, that's about all the time we have uh, in our um, for, for this uh, lecture today. Uh, I'd like to pause uh, very and take um, a question or two very quickly before we, we end this session. Either if we have a question from our internet viewers uh, or from any of you, I'll be glad to uh, address a question from you. Any, any questions? Any questions? Yes, my brother. Is there a father, uh, the name of Abraham Father? Uh, yes. Um, the, the question is that the name of Ibrahim's father, uh, is it mentioned in the Quran? So in the Quran, his name is given as Azar. Azar. In the Bible, is given as Terah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, this question. Do Christians believe that this Holy Spirit has come in multiple people, or is it just one person at a time? Because if it's in other people, and they come to different understanding of Christianity, wouldn't that be very hard to reconcile? Yeah. Question. Do Christians uh, understand that the Holy Spirit only comes in one person, or does He come in multiple persons at once? And how do we explain, in this light, the multiple interpretations of Christianity? Uh, is the Holy Spirit in all of them, giving them different interpretations? So the answer to that is that Christians believe that the Holy Spirit comes in all of the Christian believers all at once. And, uh, and, and uh, yes, this, this becomes a problem because when we see that various Christians have different interpretations of the faith and each one claims to have the Holy Spirit who is inspiring him or her to have precisely that interpretation, that, that, that becomes problematic. The question is who really has the Holy Spirit and there's no one way of proving this or, or, or disproving it that, that somebody has the Holy Spirit or not. The best way is that one has to go back and study the history and see what was the original faith before it became these multiple faiths so we can compare what is the result at one end of a long series of developments with what was there before and we can see okay what was the original faith that's the way we have to compare and when we do that we can see that the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him did actually come to reinstate that original uh, faith and uh, the spirit that came to him is the, the angel Gabriel who delivered to him the, the correct uh, information about the message of God. Uh, let me end here and, and to inform you very quickly that uh, we tonight will we'll have our iftar uh, upstairs just, just quickly to break the fast. By that I mean some dates and water will be distributed. We'll break our fast up here quickly and then uh, we'll pray Maghrib. And after Maghrib, we'll go down to enjoy the goodies uh, as usual. There will be some samosa and uh, there, there is a, there is a uh, meal of, of chicken. So uh, we'll enjoy that later, but we'll break our fast up here. So everyone, please stay up here uh, with us for, for, uh, until the time of Maghrib.
Maghreb today. And in the few minutes that, that remain, uh, some of you were here in the Juma prayer, and uh, I made an appeal uh, for you to support our television uh, program. Oh, it looks like uh, uh, some goodies are going for the people of Yatikaf, right? Well, one of the perks of making Yatikaf. Okay, let them enjoy. And hopefully they'll make some good du'as for us. So, uh, they are and you heard me feel that was for people to support television uh, so we're very good response from people watching our show I read a response from a young girl she's only 16 years old her name is Sydney uh, is, uh, in fact, Sydney is not the capital. Melbourne is capital, right? Uh, Sydney, anyway, a, a major city in Australia. That's the name. Her name is Sydney. I didn't give her a last name to protect her identity. She's 16 years old. Uh, she said to us, she just, uh, she said, I'm 16. I just took the Shahada. And then she wrote to us uh, saying that our show helped her to understand Islam because there are many scholars on YouTube, but she finds many of them to be very rigid. Uh, but on our show, she finds like there is a comfort level because we're not condemning people. We're are, you know, making people feel good, made her feel good, she understood Islam. Okay, so we're getting very good responses like this from non-Muslims and some new Muslims. Some people uh, are embracing Islam, sometimes I go to another city, I meet somebody, they say, I always wanted to meet you because it is through your show that I embrace Islam. So. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this. Uh, it means that the people who are funding this show will get reward from Allah Azza wa Jal. You know, if we invite a person to come and pray here, and reward there, invited that person, and that person came and prayed, right? The hadith says, The one who invites towards a good deed is like the one who has done it. Now, uh, what about if you invite a person to Islam? And that person embraces Islam, that person will pray, that person will fast, give zakat, make hajj, do all of the good deeds of Muslims, and you will get reward for all of those things as well. You will see it on the Day of Judgment. So I encourage you to continue to support this show. The show has been running now since 2001. We started in the spring of 2001, and uh, now it's 2016. So it's 16 years uh, old. We've been doing this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the continuous support of the community. It's costing us $1,100 per week just for the air time to run the show and uh, then we put the clips on our uh, uh, our website and it's viewed around the world as well through YouTube and directly from our website QuranSpeaks.com so today we made an appeal during the Jummah Khutbah many people uh, donated at that time there are some people here who weren't here at the Jummah Khutbah time uh, so I want to appeal to you now for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brothers and sisters can you support this program one person can say, okay, I'll give $1,100, that'll just be for the support of one week's show. Show me your hand if you can do that for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To support uh, one week's airtime with $1,100. And you don't have to give it all at once. You can say, I'm pledging it now, this is the month of Ramadan. The angels will write it right away as a complete good deed for me. And I will pay, it, uh, let's say, $100 a month over the next 11 months. So, uh, we will get your bank details, uh, we'll program it so that the $100 come out every month, and uh, by next Ramadan you'll be done, inshallah. So let me see your hands, if, if on that basis you can pledge $1,100, uh, $1 which is 100 a month times the next 11 months, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help this program. So that the message of Islam can get into the living room of the entire nation. You know, every time uh, some bombing or something like this happens, and 